welcome everyone. I, uh, tonight's debate is a really interesting question and a, a tough one. And we have a really, un, like, really good lineup um, for all of you. And I, I think you're really gonna enjoy it. I'd like to just introduce you to who we have. And so in order of uh, that they will be speaking, we will start with Charlotte Clymer. Charlotte is a writer, communications consultant, and LGBTQ activist. She is currently a political fellow at Georgetown University's McCourt School of Public Policy and writes Charlotte's Web Thoughts, I love that, a political blog hosted exclusively on Substack. She also served in the US Army from 2005 through, through 2012, and she lives in Washington, DC. Next, we have Giselle Donnelly, who is a senior fellow in defense and national security at the American Enterprise Institute, where she focuses on national security and military strategy operations, programs, and defense budgets. From 1995 to 1999, Ms. Donnelly served as a policy group director and professional staff member at the House Armed Services Committee. She has also served as a member of the US-China Economic and Security Review Commission, the editor of Armed Forces Journal and Army Times, and deputy editor of Defense News. Next, we have Lieutenant Colonel Daniel L. Davis. Lieutenant Colonel Davis is the senior fellow and military expert for defense priorities. He is a retired army lieutenant colonel with four combat deployments, winning the Bronze Star Medal for Valor in Desert Storm in 1991 and a Bronze Star for Service in Afghanistan in 2000. He regularly appears on Fox News, CNN, BBC, and other networks sharing his foreign policy and mil military expertise. And his work has been published in the Washington Post, New York Times, The Guardian, USA Today, Newsweek, Time, Defense One, Defense News, and many other publications. Michael O'Hanlon is our next guest and he is a senior fellow at Brookings specializing in national security. He was a Peace Corps volunteer in Africa, the, uh, the uh, DRC in an earlier life. And he traveled frequently to Afghanistan in particular, as well as Iraq on research trips over the years. He was also on the CIA external advisory board during Director Petraeus' tenure at the beginning of the so-called Arab Spring. His latest book is The Art of War in the Age of Peace, US Grand Strategy and Resolute Restraint. Next, we have Tyson Chatagnier. Tyson uh, Chatagnier is assistant professor of political science at the University of Houston. He received his PhD from the University of Rochester and has previously held appointments at the Bruno Kessler Foundation, the Johns Hopkins School of Advanced International Studies, Europe, and Vanderbilt University. His research focuses on the relationship between economics and conflict, as well as civil military relations. Next, we have Sheikh Katiri, who is a foreign policy com uh, columnist at The Bulwark and author of the Substack newsletter, The Russia-Iran File. He studied strategic studies at Johns Hopkins University School of Advanced International Studies and most recently worked on a term basis for Project 2049. He grew up in Iran and is currently seeking political asylum in the United States. Next, we have John, G uh, John Allen Gay, who is executive director of the John Quincy Adams Society and the former managing editor of the, editor of the National Interest. He is co-author of the book, War with Iran, Political, Military, and Economic Consequences. And last but not least, we have Matthew King, who is the former Joseph Grego Fellow on the opinion pages of the Wall Street Journal and currently works as an aide to a retired senior US official at an international consulting firm. He has previously worked for Walter Russell Mead at the American Interest and in the Africa Regional Office of the US Treasury Department. He received his uh, bachelor's degree from Duke University in Political Science and his master's uh, from uh, Sciences Po in International Security. All right, well, with that, um, I uh, cannot wait to hear what these individuals have to say. And with that, I call this debate to order unresolved. The US should stop nation building. And so first we're gonna go to a speech in the affirmative and uh, Ms. Clymer, please take it away. You have four minutes. Thank you, Madam Chair, I appreciate that. It's an honor to join all of you tonight. I know this is such a uh, contentious topic when you really drill down into the details. And I think it's uh, a wonderful opportunity for all of us to kind of gather together and discuss this all in good faith. I am not a foreign policy expert. Uh, I'm gonna be talking to you from the perspective of someone who served a junior enlisted soldier. Um, I met Joseph M. Hernandez when I was 19. My first unit was the 3rd U.S. Infantry Regiment, and Corporal Hernandez was the kind of young man 
who would welcome new soldiers and make them feel part of the unit. He would, you know, quote unquote, square us away. That's the military lingo for making sure another soldier flies right. He was the kind of man who would go out of his way to help someone, even if they didn't know him or if he didn't know them. He had two kids, uh, he had a wife, and he died in Afghanistan in 2009. He was killed in IED. And just like the almost 7,000 service members who have been killed in Iraq and Afghanistan in the war on terror, he came back in a transfer case and arrived at Dover Air Force Base, where he was then taken by a mortuary vehicle from Dover Air Force Base to Arlington National Cemetery in the Washington, D.C. area. When you see images of soldiers carrying flag draped caskets, uh, that, was, that was the unit that we were part of. We carried those caskets. We folded flags for loved ones. We served the Tomb of the Unknown Soldier. That was our unit. And Joseph was the first enlisted soldier in American history to receive a full honors military burial. I bring him up because all I've been thinking for the last five or six months is if I were to meet his wife now and talk to his kids, who at this point are 14 and 15, I wouldn't know how to describe or justify why we've done what we've done over the past 20 years in terms of our use of the US military. I understand that there was a lot of good faith behind the reasons why uh, we engaged in military operations across the world, not just in Iraq and Afghanistan, but in other areas too. And yet, I don't know what we got out of that. And in fact, I don't think we got anything out of that. Um, I am not against foreign aid. I am not against uh, advising other countries on how to better, better their democracies or to even embrace democracy. But the one question that's been on my mind is, our country is so mired in a state of disrepair and yet we have the audacity to dictate to other countries how they should be acting in their own democratic processes. It's embarrassing, it's humiliating, and it's heartbreaking. And when folks who look at those of us who oppose continued military action ask, why do you hate your country? I don't, I love my country. I love my country greatly, but I wonder if we're looking at the same country there are people all around this nation who feel they've been forgotten by a government that has been obsessed with imperialist failures, quite frankly. And it has really come back to bite us in the ass in a really terrible way. And so what I would ask all of you tonight after you listen to my fellow distinguished panelists is to wonder how you would talk to the family of the almost 7,000 troops who have died and the hundreds of thousands of civilians and justify what we've done over the past 20 years with the US military, because I don't think we can justify it. Thank you so much. All right, thank you, Ms. Clemmer. Round of jazz hands for our brave first speaker. And thank you for your service. Um, so we will now take questions for our first speaker. And so I would like to invite panelists, you are invited to just go ahead and raise your hands um, visually if you have a question and then uh, attendees, you are welcome to raise your hands um, via Zoom. So let's start with a question from uh, Virgil Duncan. Virgil, I've just allowed you to talk. So go ahead and unmute and again, ask your question um, as though you're talking to me. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, question for the speaker. Our country is in a state of disrepair, I think only for the last couple of years. When we started this war 20 years ago, we had all the right to attempt to pull uh, all these countries, Afghanistan from Middle Ages and uh, Iraq also to establish a democracy there, since Iraq is the most advanced uh, Arab country in the area. So we had initially serious reasons. Uh, our mistake was to stay too long there. So I, I'd, I'd like the speaker to comment on these uh, things. Thank you. All right. Uh, Madam Chair, uh, 
many thanks to Virgil or Mr. Duncan for the question. I, I just, I don't understand why we are working to spread democracy in other countries when it's not quite clear that our democracy is working here at home. Uh, we have spent several years now in this intractable uh, problem with the way that our government works, um, the effort to overturn elections, uh, the lack of voting rights access, things that should be inherent in a healthy democracy are missing completely. And I, I just don't know where we find uh, the goal uh, to go into other countries and spread that message when we don't follow it ourselves. Thank you so much. All right, great. Um, and you both followed this, but just a, um, a small rule I forgot to mention, questions can go up to 30 seconds and answers can go up to a minute. Uh, for our next question, we'll go to Aiden uh, Shavas, I guess I, I just um, enabled you to talk. So go ahead and unmute and ask your question to me. Madam Chair, I'd like to ask uh, Ms. Clymer about, about our during this war, Jocko Willink has talked about needing to state everything a war is going to be before we go into it. But I'd like to ask if we could even have told the truth about what this war would have been and if we, America would have gone into it if we had stated what it would have taken in troop saturation cost and moral injury to our soldiers. And my unit suffered three times as many casualties and death the second time when we fought three times less because we weren't able to do it. And I was taken out by Bush from Fallujah. So for, for an election, because we had to pretend this would be over by Christmas. Your thoughts. Okay. Uh, Go ahead. Thank you, Mr. Shabazz, uh, for that uh, fantastic comment. Uh, it, it's honest, and we need more honesty right now about what just happened over the past 20 years. Um, I think we knew how bad it was going to be going into Iraq and Afghanistan. And I know this because foreign policy experts told us the risks that were involved. Colin Powell himself said that you know he would apply the pottery barn rule, that if you break it, you buy it. Uh, and, and we sure as hell broke it, didn't we? Um, it, it wasn't just foreign policy experts, it was journalists, the rare journalists, but many journalists who spoke up and, and, and told us that this was going to happen. Um, uh, experts in international affairs told us this was going to happen. And we just ignored all of these very smart people and decided to plow ahead without really answering their concerns. And this is the result now. So it's heartbreaking. And I, I hope to God that we internalize this lesson. All right. And I apologize for not final... calling Madam Chair roll. <laughs> That's okay. <laughs> you caught yourself. That's the first time anyone has ever actually done that. I'm impressed. Um, so one final question uh, from, and this one was submitted in advance. Uh, so with regard to foreign aid, so not military action, but foreign aid, what conditions or circumstances should be present in a country before the U.S. commits to providing foreign aid? Ooh, Madam Chair, that is a very complicated question. Uh, I, I think the central, uh, you know, touching point there is, do we provide aid to countries where human rights abuses are occurring? Uh, is that a condition of cultural relativity, which is not something I believe in? I believe in a standard model of human rights, regardless of the country it is. Uh, but it's going to take a lot more introspection and thoughtful uh, entry into these kind of areas uh, in order to ethically administer foreign aid. And I'm not sure we've been able to... Uh, really grab onto a process that does that properly yet. All right, very good. And with that, Ms. Climbers, thanks. Jazz hands once again for good questions and good answers. By the way, I don't remember if I explained jazz hands tonight. For anybody who's unfamiliar, what they are is our way of showing approval. And I invite you to use them at any point during any speech or question that you wish to. Uh, and um, if you're at home and not on the screen, I recommend that you do them to your screen. Uh, and I'm only kind of kidding. I, I told someone recently that I, um, I recently got married and my new husband sometimes sees me doing this after he says something at dinner and he's like, what, what? But, but I think it adds the fun. All right, um, with that, we are looking for a speech in the negative and we will go to uh, Giselle Dunnell. Ms. Dunnell, you have four minutes, go ahead. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. I appreciate it. Um, although uh, it's a bit intimidating um, uh, following Charlotte's uh, comments, um, I have to say that uh, her emotions are clearly widespread amongst those who have served uh, in the last two decades, especially those who have been touched by the loss uh, of uh, the thousands of people who've given their, their lives for the for the mission. 
I have to shift, unfortunately, from the realm of emotion to analysis in order to best contribute to the, uh, uh, to the conversation. And in that regard, I think we would do well to define our terms uh, uh, in, at the start of this conversation. Uh, I would uh, offer that what we really should be talking about is whether the United States should engage in state building, that is, uh, providing some level of functional governance, a decent level of functional governance, uh, when we employ military force. Uh, Colin Powell's uh, pottery barn rule uh, certainly does apply, and it does mean that the idea that we can uh, strike from a distance and just leave uh, a lot of broken pottery in our wake is really an insufficient uh, approach to the use of force. And I think a really deeply un-American one too, which I will return to at the end. So again, I, I would hope that we could focus not so much on nation building. Nations are organic things that sort of rise up from the bottom, social and familial uh, contracts and contacts that, that form and is not, no outsider can uh, impose a culture, uh, uh, at least not, uh, not easily on, on a culture that uh, doesn't want to be imposed upon. But that said, it is possible uh, to help people organize themselves, and in particular, uh, to perform as decently as possible the, the first role of any government, which is to provide security for its citizens. And that is something that America has, America has been remarkably successful at uh, throughout its history. We don't as awful as the debacle at the Kabul airport was, that should not be the lens through which we view um, the subject or really the whole course of the use of American military power in the world. I, this is a, a point that uh, it, you know, requires a lot of elaboration, but my favorite example, and one that should resonate with all Americans, is that of our own civil war a really much bloodier conflict than anything that we've uh, experienced in the last 20 years. And one that certainly wasn't over in April, 1865. There was a period of reconstruction in the South for uh, military operations, a counterinsurgency operation, one might easily say. And of course, even that wasn't sufficient to fully reintegrate uh, the Southern states into our national union. And many people would argue, I think with good reason, that that effort continues until this very day. So um, the, the idea that uh, it takes a long time to fully uh, integrate and democratize and liberalize a society is something that we should understand intuitively from our own American experience and also from our experience in the world, uh, from World War II onward. And our successes far outnumber and are far more important than our failures. The fact that Germany and Japan, two horrific dictatorships, two horrific tyrannies, are now reliably democratic countries uh, who are no threat to anyone, uh, it's a, is a world historic accomplishment. We should not denigrate that, nor should we ever forget it. I want to say too that one thing I would say to the families of the fallen is that actually the accomplishments of Iraq and Afghanistan were greater than we now appreciate. The fact that uh, the Taliban's Afghanistan, which alas has returned uh, to, to life, was not for 20 years after 9-11 the basis or the base for continued terrorist attacks on the United States is a not insignificant accomplishment. And one we were able to um, uh, contribute to up until the very end. Uh, so at a, a relatively low price, uh, a, a great good was accomplished. And I think even a greater good was accomplished in Iraq. Um, our withdrawal was hugely uh, tragic, uh, both for uh, the Iraqi people, the people of the region, and I think uh, for America and its interests too. 
Um, the rise of ISIS to power uh, was something that is, is almost, uh, or certainly in the same sort of uh, shaming league as the uh, uh, withdrawal from Afghanistan was. And I think history will say that as uh, difficult, uh, almost done, uh, as, the, as the wars were, that to, for us to leave uh, was a greater humiliation. And finally, I wanna say, we are who we are as a society. Our own society is held together by a set of political principles that we fall constantly short of, but always are a beacon to us in our daily lives and certainly to the way we operate as a nation in the world. So you have to ask yourself, are we capable as a state, as a nation, as a people of turning our backs, uh, especially in cases uh, where we've intervened for national security interests, or do we have some moral obligation to continue to try to reconstruct what we have broken in a way that will be better for people who we've uh, uh, intervened against and for our own, uh, our, uh, and for ourselves. Thank you, Madam Chairman. Uh, pardon me if yes. I've overstayed my welcome. <laughs> <laughs> no worries. Thank you. And jazz hands for our brave first negative. Thank you so much. We will now take questions for the speaker. Um, and we have a lot of them. Uh, yeah, go ahead. Uh, Ms. Clymer, ask your question to me. Sure. Uh, Madam Chair, I just uh, want to say what a, a pleasure and honor it is to be in this debate alongside Ms. Donnelly, someone whom I greatly respect. I want to ask Ms. Donnelly, uh, what would you say again to the families of you know those seven thousand soldiers? Not not just them, but really the families of the hundreds of thousands of Iraqi and Afghan civilians who have died in the past twenty years. All right, go ahead, Ms. Um, uh, thank you, Madam Chairman, and thank you, Charlotte, for the for the question. I think I would say a version of the same sort of thing um, that I would say to a, a Vietnam vet or to a World War II vet or a Korean War vet or to anyone who had served or that I would say to my wife, who's a Navy veteran. Um, and that uh, it would be that your service was honorable. It's, it's if you, again, the, the loss of any life is a tragedy and the pain isn't any different uh, for the families or the survivors of someone who was killed in World War II or Vietnam or in Iraq and Afghanistan. All one can do is empathize uh, with, uh, with those people. But I would try to tell them that uh, over the course of time, history will paint this mission in a different light than the pain of the moment uh, reveals. So um, uh, I would do my best to try to console them. And again, to make them see that their sacrifice and their service was not something that was done in vain. Uh, and that uh, one hopes that in the course of time uh, that there will be um, something more obvious to show uh, for and something more positive than simply preventing terrorism or removing the dictator Saddam Hussein uh, from, uh, from office. Uh, so right. that's what I would say. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, so we'll now take a question from Evany Quimsey. I enabled you to talk. Go ahead and unmute and ask your question to me. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, Madam Chair, I would like to address, uh, ask a question to Ms. Donnelly. Mm -hmm. And the question is, uh, you talk about the simple she fact that about, we, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Uh, Ms. Donnelly, you talked about the simple fact that, um, that the Taliban, uh, was like that we were fighting the Taliban while we were over there. It's the simple fact that after only a week of us be removing ourselves from Iraq, that the Taliban, I'm sorry, from Afghanistan, that the Taliban came back so quickly. How effective were we in Afghanistan if the Taliban could come back so quickly? Very good, Ms. Donnelly. Um, uh, thank you, uh, Evany, for the question and uh, Madam Chairman for uh, giving me the opportunity to reply. Um, first of all, the, the return of the Taliban was something that uh, had happened in increments, uh, not I think for some months, but actually 
uh, for some years. Um, when we announced that we were on a timeline in Afghanistan, there's a, a famous saying that I'm sure many in this panel will recognize that um, um, Americans had all the watches, but the Afghans had all the time uh, in Afghanistan. And so for the many Afghans who stood with us, for many years, they've been looking over their shoulder, uh, waiting for us to leave when we essentially announced that we were going to leave. And likewise, the Taliban had just been waiting for us to leave. So part of the problem was that we built an Afghan state that was dependent upon our support. And then we removed that uh, support in a, a a precipitous way and didn't compensate in ways that would have allowed the Afghan government to continue uh, to, um, uh, to, to uh, be the principal actor in Afghanistan. All right. And with that, our speaker is thanked. Jazz hands once more for good questions asked and excellent answers. Okay. Um, we are now looking for a speech in the affirmative. Also panelists, I'm just gonna warn you, I'm very strict about the jazz hands. And so I will be pointing out, you need a jazz hand, you need a jazz hand. Um, so for our next speech, uh, we're looking for a speech in the affirmative and I'd like to call on Lieutenant Colonel Davis. Go ahead and, oh, you're already unmuted, perfect. You have four minutes, go ahead. Very good, thank you. Uh, I'm super happy to be here. I'm really grateful to, for the opportunity to weigh in on this which is a very important topic and one that I, I wish was a much more part of the mainstream conversation in the United States, because it could avoid uh, a lot of disaster that we've had. If we'd have had these conversations before, we might have uh, avoided so much of the loss that we and others have suffered before. Now, I've only got four minutes, so I can't even come close to a comprehensive uh, evaluation of, of this. So I'm only gonna restrict myself to, to one specific point, which I think is one of the most important uh, the second one would have been what, what Charlotte uh, talked about, but she was so eloquent in, in what she discussed about that. I, I couldn't have improved upon it if I, if I had tried, so I'm, I'm really grateful for her uh, input on that. But the question I would ask that before we contemplate any kind of a foreign policy action, and especially one that is even thinking about nation building, is we have to say, would a given policy, a proposed policy, has a reasonable chance of, of recurring, returning a positive outcome for the United States at a cost and during a time frame that is uh, reasonable for the United States. And by that standard, uh, the 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 question, the answer is, is most of the time going to be no. And in fact, I would argue that really since the end of World War II, especially. Uh, the, the reason why I am so adamant that we should get out of the nation building business is because it never works. Uh, and that spans anywhere from an abject, absolute catastrophic failure to a just kind of, yeah, it's not really that important. It's not really that bad. It was just kind of muddled along. That's the framework. That's the range, which with our nation building operations have thus far uh, continued or have operated in. And, and that is a profound waste of that. I mean, let's go back to Vietnam. I mean, we were building the South Vietnamese government. And when after about 10 years of that, we said, you know, this is not going anywhere, we're going to lose. So we, we closed that thing out. And of course, as we all know, the North Vietnamese ended up winning that. And we were told so many times that we had to fight that war and we had to help build that democracy in there because of the famous falling dominoes, or it would be catastrophic. We were told but of course, the domino didn't fall. That one fell over and nothing else fell over. And it had no impact on the United States national security after that. And then, then you had to, to go with, uh, you know, even into Bosnia. That was kind of partially not really a big failure. In some regards, it was success. Uh, the other one that's kind of talked about as success is maybe in Nicaragua. Uh, although I would argue that in both those, especially in the latter case there, it was the people of Nicaragua that had the motive and the, and the drive and the passion to really make that successful. And it was they who did the lion's share of the work. But then you have the, the Afghan war and you have the, the uh, Iraq war. Uh, and, and those were just yeah, absolute failures. And, and, and I, in my view, I served on the ground in both of those places. And, and, and I can tell you with as much authority as I can pull out that there was nothing positive about those, that they were viewed, that they were known to be a failure almost from the beginning. 
And as a matter of fact, in, in 2009, I first wrote in the Armed Forces Journal that the Afghan war was a war on the brink of failure. And I said, if we don't make some significant changes, this could go against us. The next year in 2010, I wrote that we would lose the war in Afghanistan if we didn't make these fundamental changes. And, and all of the things that I warned about there are precisely what precipitated the, the disaster. And, and we're now we, we saw on graphic display. Now, I understand that we want to help people, that you know, we want others to, to rise to the level that we have in terms of success and, and governance and freedom and liberty. And those are all good things. But for a nation to grow, for, for a government to change into something that's more positive than what it was, it's got to come from the inside out. We simply can't impose it from the outside. The culture is issues with that. Uh, the, there's the, the time constraint. There's the fact that, uh, as uh, Ms. Donnelly just mentioned there a second ago, the, you know, the famous dictum of we have the watches, they have the time. That was true from the beginning. And it didn't matter what date you were going to put on that. The Taliban always knew we were going to leave at some point and that they were going to be left. The Afghan people knew that at some point we were going to leave. And then after that, it would be left with the with the, uh, the Taliban or the Afghan government, who, by the way, unfortunately, they never trusted. So this loss was predicted and, and easily evidenced to anyone who was willing to look at the hard points a full decade before the, the collapse happened, which took no one by surprise who served any time on the ground there to, to watch what was happening. And that's kind of the case everywhere. You can even up. throw in there Iran, uh, in, you know, in 1953, when we overthrew that government, and we're still paying for that failure today. And everywhere you want to look, it's nothing but failure, failure, failure. And as Charlotte pointed out, the cost to the United States in blood and treasure is astronomical. And we just can't keep making these failures uh, and, and imposing those costs on future generations. All right, very good. Jazz hands for the Lieutenant Colonel. Thank you, everybody. Excellent. Um, so we have a lot of questions here. Uh, we're gonna start with Ms. Donald. Go ahead, ask your question to me. Thank you, Madam Chair. Well, would you please ask my friend, Danny, uh, who I was pleased to publish uh, when I worked at AFJ, um, whether how he would describe um, the Korean War and our, and our continued presence there. there. Certainly on the battlefield, it was a very ambiguous uh, outcome that remains so. Um, but if we're going to call it a failure, that doesn't seem right either. So I would very much benefit from his description of uh, Korea, for example. Great, go ahead. Yeah, that, that's, that's a, a, we're talking specifically about nation building and that was, that was a combat situation that we got into. Uh, you know, you can, you can debate whether we should or shouldn't have gotten into it in the first place, but we did. And once we got in there, we, we fought to the standstill. Uh, now that was, of course, we have to take into consideration the primary reason, maybe the sole reason that that was a stalemate and not an outright American victory was because China came in on the side of the North Koreans. And then now they came up to eventually the 38th parallel. And so we had a, a hostile force that was much bigger than just that one on the side here. And, and the, the government that we proposed or that we uh, had defended, they were not able to defend themselves. So we, we if we had just left, they would have they would have collapsed now. Perhaps you can even argue that maybe we should have done that. But uh, the fact that we didn't is, is, I think, a unique situation to the geopolitical situation that was going on at the time. It was in the middle of the Cold War. You had the USSR. It was also backing them. And so this was a, a international conflict here. And that was kind of the front lines. Very different than the situation in Afghanistan and Iraq today, I think. All right. Um, I'm interested in this follow up. Um, just please make it brief, Giselle, and then. Ms. Donnelly, and then quick answer, uh, and we'll- I the appreciate question. the indulgence, uh, Madam Chairwoman. Uh, but I would ask him, since 1953, that looks a lot like nation building or state building. There's been no, mercifully, no direct combat, but it's provided a security framework for South Korea to move from a, you know, a cult of uh, family rule to a, a thriving democracy and a booming economy. Well, I, see, I think that there's uh, there's an argument to be made that we could and possibly even should have left a long time ago uh, because the South Koreans are no longer a backward country. They are no longer, as they were in 1953, unable to defend themselves. I served in Korea and I saw on the ground and, and worked actually directly with the second Korean army. And I, I 
Dobbs think they're much more capable than a lot of people give them credit for. And I think that they're fully capable of defending themselves today. And I, I think that we should even look at handing them control of the CFC forces and, and continuing to move back because they don't need us anymore. And I think that us staying there just keeps them actually dependent on us unnecessarily. All right, excellent. And I'm gonna take a pre-submitted question. Um, it is, uh, this says, if we were to stop nation building, would that entail scaling back our worldwide military presence? Should we do that? What would the implications of that be? The, I, I, I am a strong advocate of a strong national defense. And I have always been from the time I served, I'm in no way, shape or form uh, anti-war, uh, but I am for a significantly restrained foreign policy from what we have had, because I'm for a sane foreign policy that has a military component behind it. And I argue that the national security apparatus of the United States, our armed forces, exist to defend the United States, not to be an offensive uh, tool to go and accomplish what we want by force in other parts of the world. I think that if we limited ourselves to diplomacy and to economic impacts, I think that there's a lot more that we could accomplish uh, in, in that regard without using the threat of force or the actual application of force. And I think overall, we would be better. Now, not using force sometimes means that we have to accept that we don't get to do everything we want. We don't get to win all the you know, con uh, conflicts that we want, not conflicts, but economic uh, engagement, et cetera. It don't work out the way we want, but our security will never be threatened. And I think that our overall security would be significantly increased if we scale back the use of force that we have across the world. All right, and with that, the speaker is thanked. Jazz hands for Lieutenant Colonel Davis. Very good. Um, I know that a lot of folks didn't get to ask their questions, but keep them in your minds because I bet they'll be relevant later on. Okay, um, our next spe speech, uh, we are looking for a speaker in the negative and I'd like to go to Michael O'Hanlon. Go ahead, you have four minutes. Thank you, April, greetings everyone. And thank you for the very rich historical dialogue as well as the contemporary policy debate that we've just heard uh, from Colonel Davis and Giselle and others. I wanna make two points. And uh, I was grateful, April, that you uh, allowed me to tailor my biography uh, for this event to say that I was a Peace Corps volunteer in Africa. And generally speaking, I agree with Colonel Davis that when we can stay out of state building, and I think Giselle Donnelly's right to use that term, but we should try to stay out or at least minimize our role. And if we look around the world in Africa, in a number of UN peace operations missions, what we see is that, sure, the UN sometimes gets a bad name, sometimes fails, but it's conducting 14 missions around the world right now at an annual cost total of $7 billion from all countries combined, the US share less than 2 billion. And that gives peace a chance in 14 places. Will it always work? No, but historically, and a lot of people have worked hard on this problem statistically and otherwise to look at past UN efforts, the chances of some degree of improvement in the prospects for a country are usually 60% or better when there's a UN mission. It's not always a state building mission. Sometimes it's a simple peacekeeping or peace operation or peace uh, observation mission. But generally speaking, that's what I would prefer because I do think our armed forces are fundamentally first and foremost about protecting the homeland as Colonel Davis said, and about securing great power peace and the stability of the international environment and the international economy that's allowed so much prosperity to occur and be spread in the last 75 years. So I agree in principle, that should be our go-to approach. And we should be willing to help the UN get a little better with small amounts of technical advisory assistance as well as financial support. But that's the right default strategy. So that's my first point. But my second point is for those who wanna say, especially in the aftermath of the Afghanistan tragedy of recent times, let's go through the history and remember the key steps. Because if we get too theological, just saying let's never do nation building, then I think we actually sometimes foreclose options that can reduce the burden for future state building. So in Afghanistan, first of all, let's give the Afghans credit. They helped us win the Cold War. We gave them weaponry after the Soviets invaded in the 19, well, in late 1979 and then through the 80s. 
And they defeated the Soviets and really brought about Glasnost and Perestroika and Gorbachev and the reforms and the end of the Cold War because they showed the Soviet model didn't work. So I think we have a certain obligation at a moral level to them, which makes this case a little different. Second, we went in after 9-11 to overthrow a regime that had been collaborationist with Al Qaeda. I think most of us would probably agree that was the right thing to do. So once the Taliban is gone from power, what do you do? Do you literally just walk out and let it become a free for all again? I don't think that's a very appealing option. The very George W. Bush administration that had mocked the idea of state building a year before in its presidential campaign chose to at least try to do a little bit in Afghanistan because it seemed too much of a contradiction of American values to work with this country that had helped us win the Cold War. And then we had overthrown the Taliban. Are we really just going to leave and let them go back into uh, you know, a Machiavellian, a Hobbesian chaos. So we tried to have a minimalist approach to state building and it didn't work. We didn't do enough. We lost the golden window. The next five years were relatively peaceful in Afghanistan. If we had built up a small capacity in the state in that five-year window, I think that there's a good chance they could have fended off the Taliban when the latter tried to carry out a revenge or a resurgence a half decade later. I am not going to get into a big political debate about who's responsible for that lack of exploitation of the opportunity. I don't think I did enough as a scholar to advocate for a better effort in that period of time, but partly because we were so averse to nation building or state building, partly because we were focused on Iraq, we didn't do enough. And then Obama comes in. And by the way, McCain would have done the same thing because they both say we hadn't done enough in Afghanistan. And now they're trying to make up for lost time because we have been so ideologically opposed to the idea of doing a moderate amount that now we try to overcompensate and do too much too fast. So I'm gonna finish by simply saying that if you get too theological on this question, too puritanical, too you know, absolutist, we either do state building or we don't, you're getting a little bit divorced from the real world. And the real world requires more pragmatic decisions. And if we had been a little smarter in that early period in 2002, three, four, five in Afghanistan, done a little more state building along with our European allies, I think there's a good chance that we wouldn't have had to do the Obama surge and we would have had just a steadier, more gradual approach that would have created at least as good of an outcome, probably better as what we've witnessed. But again, when you go back in time, when is the moment you really think we could have just heartlessly pulled out of Afghanistan, a country that had helped us win the Cold War, that had suffered under Taliban rule? Is it really realistic to think we would have pulled out at a given moment, let's say in 2002? And if not, then we should avoid these somewhat highfalutin debates about yes or no, state building or not, and be a little more pragmatic. How do we minimize our role mm -hmm. so that we do enough, but not more than necessary? And I'll leave it at that. Thank you. Very good. Um, jazz hands. Yeah, absolutely. Very interesting. Um, it gets more interesting by the minute. We're going to start with uh, Tim Mulhern. Uh, I allowed you to talk, so go ahead and unmute and ask your question to me. Yes, I'd like to ask, can you hear me? Yes, we can. All right, sorry. Um, but what, what my rub in this whole conversation is our initial engagement with Afghanistan dealt with Al Qaeda, Al Qaeda and removing Osama bin Laden. Then it escalated. So I'm not going to talk about nation building, state building. I'm talking about cause and effect, stimulus response, um, a biological action. Uh -huh. My question is, I think we missed the whole article by losing focus on Osama bin Laden and Al Qaeda. It wasn't trying to honor uh, of the Taliban and, and reflect their input to uh, defeating um, Russia. I think our major objective at the beginning was Al Qaeda. And I and think- so your question is, what does the speaker think of that? Well, well, my question is, I think we lose focus. I, 
coming okay. from a, a, a Vietnam background and a military background, um, and seeing that decisions have major consequences, I'm adamant about being sincerely focused on what the objective is and right. staying focused on the objective. Thank okay. you very much. Yes. Um, so yeah, go ahead. Thoughts, Mr. Hammond? Uh, Madam Chairwoman and uh, Tim, thank you. Excellent. And I think very, very on point. And what I would simply say is the only reason that the international community tried to strengthen the Afghan government is because we wanted them to be able to keep Al Qaeda off their territory long term and ideally keep the Taliban from coming back to power. This was an unrepentant Taliban that, no, that did not apologize ever for its ties to Al Qaeda and, in fact, continued to have a lot of links to Al Qaeda. In fact, they still do today, which makes me a little nervous about where we are. But in that period of time, I think our main choice was okay, the US military mission in Afghanistan in 2002, 3, 4, 5 was mostly about going after Al Qaeda. We let the Europeans do a little bit of the state building and peacekeeping. We kept our mitts off that and we went after Al Qaeda. And that was fine, except we realized by 06, 07 that the Afghan state did not have the capacity to fend off the Taliban. And if the Taliban came back, maybe Al Qaeda is going to come right behind them. So you have a very tough choice in that period of time. And neither President Bush, nor Senator McCain, nor Senator Obama at that time thought that the smartest thing was just to leave and hope for the best. Everybody thought we should try to improve the Afghan government's ability to keep the Taliban and Al Qaeda out themselves. Maybe everybody was wrong. In fact, there's a good case that everybody was wrong. But the logic of that period of time, of that moment, said, let's not just pull out again, because we did that in 1989, and look what followed. Let's try to keep this state strong enough that they can then hopefully keep terrorists from operating off their territory in the future. So it didn't entirely work, but there was a pretty compelling logic to trying. And it wasn't just because of some highfalutin commitment to state building or nation building. Excellent. Um, so we're gonna take a pre-submitted question here. Uh, and it is, if in certain circumstances, nation building is necessary and potentially beneficial, should we be supporting other nations to engage in nation building? Should other nations follow our lead? Yeah, great question. And that's why I started with my Peace Corps experience and UN peacekeeping in Africa. And for the most part, what happens in UN peacekeeping, as I think everybody on this panel knows, and probably most of the participants, is that most of the troops, almost all the troops are not American. Uh, they're mostly from developing countries, in fact. And the contribution financially of the United States is about 25% but it's 25% of a $7 billion a year total price tag. I mean, the Pentagon spends that much money literally in a day. That's our <laughs> daily Department of Defense budget. And it's equal to our entire annual contribution to all 14 UN peacekeeping operations that are attempted around the world. So that's generally what I wanna do. I agree, Colonel Davis, enough with you. I agree enough with the other people on the other side of this debate, but that's, that's my default go-to mode for me as well, even though I've been couched and portrayed as a pro state builder, along with my good friend, Giselle Donnelly. And, uh, and I'm proud to be in that company. But I do think that when we can do this in a more indirect way with limited American engagement, that is generally the preference. All right. And with that, Mr. Hanlon is thanked. Jazz hands for good questions and good answers. All right. Um, Yes, Charlotte, very good. And Lieutenant Colonel Davis, I will need to see your jazz hands at some point. Yes, very good. <laughs> Thank you, very good. All right, um, so for our next speaker uh, in the affirmative, we're gonna go to Tyson Chatonnier. Go ahead and unmute, you have four minutes. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair, and, um, and thank you to Barry Angels for, for inviting me to be here with uh, such a distinguished panel. Um, I find it interesting to, uh, to sort of be here on the affirmative side of the resolution because um, 20 years ago, when I was in college, if you had asked me to be part of the debate, um, I would have been on either side. Uh, so I was very much a supporter of, of the Afghan invasion, of, of the invasion of Iraq. Um, to some extent, my views have changed in the last 20 years. Uh, to some extent, I think we've learned a lot from, uh, from both of these experiences. And I think that when we talk about uh, nation building, or we talk about, as, as some of my co-panelists said, uh, state building, which I think is a, a good way to describe this, um, what we're talking about sort of today is usually democratization. 
right? In other words, building institutions, bringing democratic governance to states that are lacking it for one reason or another. And I think there are a lot of reasons to support democratization um, from a moral, from a normative perspective, self-determination is important, right? We can probably all agree that the right to, uh, to sort of choose your leaders, right, to be able to choose how you're governed is an important thing. Uh, from a strategic perspective, it's important too, right? We know that democratic countries tend to have good relations with one another. Uh, in 2004, when he was explaining his, his sort of mission in Iraq, President Bush said, um, and the reason I'm so strong on democracy is that democracies don't go to war with one another. And this is generally true. It's incomplete, though. There's more nuance to that uh, than, than sort of the way that, that President Bush put it. Uh, in fact, what we know is that mature democratic states don't engage in large scale wars with each other. Um, and that might seem like splitting hairs, like it's sort of trivial, uh, but it's important in practice because there's real implications for how we approach the task of nation or state or institution building. Uh, so this is going to be a bit of an oversimplification too, but to some extent in the early 2000s, there was sort of this sense that we would go into a country like Iraq or Afghanistan, um, we would overthrow the leadership, sort of non-democratic leadership there, we would hold elections, uh, and we would be rewarded with a democratic state and all the nice things that come along with having a democratic state there. Um, when we think about mature democratic states, like what you see in the United States, what you see in Western Europe, uh, electoral institutions are part of that story, but they're not all the story. Um, these institutions tend to evolve from, from the bottom up. They evolve slowly over time, and they evolve alongside democratic norms, things like fair play and things like liberalism, not in the, not in the sort of liberal versus conservative sense in the United States, but sort of general liberalism. Um, and so when it comes to states that don't already have a history of, of democracy, they need to develop those sorts of things as well. Um, and those are not the sorts of things that we can instill in a country overnight. And so if we have a commitment to democratization and a commitment to, to state building, we need to have a very deep and long-term commitment to that country. And this, I think, is where the problem comes in. So I am a firm believer in exploiting comparative advantage. Um, and I think something we've learned over the last 20 to 30 years is that the U.S. military is really, really good at some things and not quite as good at other things. So it's really good at going in and overwhelming the enemy. It's really good at removing leaders from power it's not quite as good at sort of what comes next, at, at sort of ensuring that something is built up in its place. And I think there are a lot of incentives on the part of US leadership uh, to get in and out quickly because these sorts of, uh, of projects are in, uh, expensive, they are time consuming, and to the average American, the benefits are not immediately apparent. And so to me, the comparative advantage when it comes to nation building or state building lies with international organizations who tend to have these longer time horizons who are responsive to different audiences, who have different kinds of training, and they're gonna be generally better suited to that kind of long-term institution building that we need to see in order to get that democratization off the ground. Um, this doesn't mean the U.S. should be uninvolved, right? Uh, so as a global hegemon, the U.S. plays a really important role in, in international politics. Uh, its support sort of militarily, financially, is gonna be key in helping missions to succeed. Uh, but I think that when it comes to state building, that's a burden that the United States should not be taking upon itself, uh, both because it's costly to the U.S. and because I think U.S. involvement sort of alone uh, or, or almost alone uh, can be counterproductive. Uh, so thank you. All right. Very good. Jazz hands. Yes. Excellent. For our first question, we will go to Ms. Uh, oh, actually, let's go to Mr. King, just because you have not spoken yet tonight. Thank you very much, Madam Chair. I was. Uh listening intently to my colleagues' remarks, and I was especially struck by the contention at the end that international organizations have a comparative advantage in nation building. And I was just wondering, to whom are international organizations accountable? Because states have leaders, leaders are accountable through the political process, but to whom are international organizations accountable when it comes to governing other societies? Thanks very much. So thank you for the question. Um, so I, I, I think the, the important thing here is um, that when it comes to these international organizations, any kind of accountability they have is going to be sort of longer term. Um, and I, I, think, I think the fact that leaders are sort of accountable to their publics is where the problem comes in. Because again, these sorts of the benefits that we see uh, from things like state building are not immediately apparent to, to, to people, uh, some people on the ground. And so there's this incentive that even if this is gonna be long-term beneficial, to try to get out of it, right? And so I think actually one of the advantages that, that the international organizations have 
is that that accountability is a little fuzzier, right? And so the degree to which they have any sort of accountability is to, to their member states, which ultimately, to some extent, filters down to, to citizens in these different countries. Uh, but I think they're more insulated, which I think is, is the benefit to them. All right, very good. Uh, we will go with a, an attendee question. Um, Mr. Uh, Rich Procida, you've been very patient. I've enabled you to talk. Go ahead and unmute and ask your question to me. Thank you. It's uh, important that there's something about the assumptions going on here. To say that the United States has been a friend of democracy and has promoted democracy is at least half true. It's half false. It's not all true. And the way I see it, the threat to our democracy directly becomes from the global assault on a democracy that is occurring right now. So we have a threat to democracy. And what I've heard today- in Your question? Yeah, mm -hmm. In Afghanistan is that we didn't do enough nation building. So my question is, is there nothing we can do to save democracy? Is there nothing that we should do? And don't we have a responsibility to those countries we invade for other reasons rather than to build democracy? We have some responsibility to those people. So can't we get, rather than minimize, get better at it? All right, thank you. Go ahead. So, so thank you for that question. Uh, yeah, I, I, I agree with you, right? I think that, um, that there is sort of responsibility. Uh, the, the, the idea of the uh, Colin Powell Pottery Barn um, doctrine uh, makes a lot of sense, right? That, that if we come in and, and sort of break it, we bought it, uh, and that it is important to sort of build democracy. And I think that's, that's the sort of thing that we have intentions to do that, but when it gets started, other sorts of things pop up, right? And so the incentive to, uh, the incentive at the beginning is to sort of talk about this, to, to, to get, it, get it started. But when it gets too costly, there's then an incentive to kind of pull out. And that's one of the reasons that I think that um, looking to those organizations that have these longer time horizons and have these fuzzier connections to, uh, to publics who don't see those benefits, that's why it's useful, right? Because these are the folks who are going to be a little more willing to, to sort of stay as it gets tougher. All right, and for a final question, Mr. Kateri. Uh, so I agree with a lot of, uh, thank you, Madam Chair, by the way. Uh, I agree with a lot of what my uh, distinguished pan uh, co-panelists said. My only question is that uh, if you're to leave to international organizations to uh, do the state building, uh, there still remains the question of uh, having an ordered society, have a security uh, that allows for a state to arise at the time that these states are, these new states are very fragile and, uh, and cannot provide order for themselves. And how can we ensure such a thing? I mean, uh, we could have left uh, you know, nations in Afghanistan to provide uh, uh, state to do state building, but as soon as we left, uh, that would have been uh, futile. All right. Uh, Go ahead. Yeah. Thank. Thank you. Um, yeah, I, I agree with you there. Right. Uh, I think. I think it is important for us to sort of maintain some kind of commitment. The the thing that I think is is sort of relevant, and and our, our sort of our resolution tonight has to do with sort of the U.S. being involved in in, in nation building or state building. Um, and and my contention here is that kind of a complete disengagement is not where we want to go. I think there's a sort of a more nuanced approach to this. And so to me, I think U.S. involvement in this sort of thing is important um, because the U.S. has the the power, the the persuasion, the capacity to help out, and it's it's important that the U.S. Uh, not only be involved, but be involved in a visible way. The only thing that I would say is the U.S. should not be taking it on its shoulders completely, right? That these sorts of uh, of the decisions and of the actions these need to be uh, taken in concert with our allies, um, and some of that burden needs to be shared by others, right? So the U.S. can play an important role. Uh, it just shouldn't be the only, or or even you know almost the only state doing so. All right, and with that, Mr. Chatagnier is thanked. Jazz hands, one more time. Thank you, Lieutenant Colonel Davis, very good. All right, um, uh, so we uh, have another uh, few speeches, but before we do that, we're gonna take a short um, moment to do a quick poll. So uh, Cliff, our poll manager, will go ahead and launch it. And everybody, you've got one minute to answer.
All right. Uh, so as we can see, uh, everyone who is attending tonight got to weigh in on sort of what are they most interested in hearing more about? And it looks like there's substantial interest in all of these questions, but I would say that the strongest interest is in alternatives to nation building. So what does this look like if we don't do that? Are there alternatives? And so would love to just um, put that in, in the panelists' mind. And then also, what have we learned from the past and how do we even think about success? So all of these questions are, are good directions, but maybe particularly of interest are the ones mentioned. Uh, so thank you. We're gonna go ahead and stop now and panelists, you'll have to close the window yourself via the little red button. So with that, we are going to move on to our next speech in the negative uh, by Mr. Shea Kateri. Shea, go ahead and unmute and you have four minutes. Uh, thank you, uh, Madam Chair and Brother Angels for inviting me. Uh, the good news is that everything I wanted to say was said by uh, Giselle and Michael, so <laughs> I, I can focus on uh, the questions in the poll. And uh, so uh, first I want to uh, point out that uh, the problem that we face in Iraq and Afghanistan, uh, there are many problems, but uh, two major ones are uh, first that these were not normal societies. These were uh, societies under the yoke of uh, civil war and totalitarianism, and the civil society had been completely ruined. So we what we should have done was to create, a, uh, create an environment, and what we tried to do, to create an environment for civil society to rebuild itself. And there's a difference, but I mean, we did state building in Granada and Panama, but it was very easy because there was a civil society, there was a state that mostly remained intact. That's not what we could have done in Afghanistan and Iraq. And there's a difference if we invade tomorrow Iran, where I am from, or uh, United Arab Emirates. Uh, Iran is, has no civil society left. And uh, what I want to point out, the second problem, uh, and this is the distinction with, uh, between the normal authoritarian and totalitarian. And the second uh, problem that we had was that we had a, uh, uh, we had a lot of uh, military uh, presence in both Afghanistan and Iraq, but our civilian uh, presence never matched it. And we asked the military to do what's the job of the civilians, what the military has no expertise in doing. And that's why a lot of our state building uh, projects failed because the military doesn't know how to do the job of the civilian and we should not blame the military, we should blame the politicians in Congress and the administrations who asked them to do, uh, to do this. And then the second, uh, and then I want to come to what are the alternatives? You know, we never went to any country to promote, we never invaded any country militarily to promote democracy or build a state. That was always uh, the question of, uh, that we went to them out of security interest. But the question is, what do you do after? One, one person says, do nothing, uh, just leave. Uh, and the problem with that is that, aside from the amor amorality of that, uh, civil war could ensue, right? And as we saw in uh, Libya and Syria, civil wars have direct effect on uh, refugee crises that uh, lead to uh, right-wing xenophobia. And you have alternative for Germany, you have uh, Donald Trump's election, which had a lot to do with refugee crisis in, uh, uh, from Syria. And then the other school of thought is that, uh, okay, put a strong man there who can rule with an iron fist. Uh, that, putting aside the morality of it, uh, does it work with the American people? That's what we should ask. We are still uh, arguing about the, uh, uh, the support we had for uh, anti-communist right-wing groups in Latin America today. And that might have been the prudent call. That might have not have been. That's a question for another uh, debate. But Americans are still angry about that, rightly or wrongly. And... Uh, no president, I don't think under the current climate, no president could stomach uh, the political backlash they would receive if they just install a Pinochet, let's say, uh, to, uh, in a country we just invaded. And I think that's the real problem we should ask. It's not that we do state building. Uh, the problem uh, is that what do you do if not that? 
And if I may just end uh, with this really quickly, there's a good question to ask why we ask the military to do all the uh, civilian job tasks, in which put resources away from its providing order to begin with, in addition to the fact that they don't have the expertise in civilian uh, duties. And my answer is that we have a, a great military, and I think it's not even strong enough for the uh, threats we face today, but uh, that military doesn't nearly match uh, the civilian uh, national security force that we need. Uh, it's hallowed out and we should, I, I think we should invest more in both, but we definitely should invest uh, more in our uh, civilian core of national security experts. All right, very good. Jazz hands for Mr. Kateri. Yes, excellent. Um, so for our first question, we're gonna go to Christina Olikowski. I've just enabled you to talk. Go ahead and unmute and ask your question to me. All right, Ms. Olikowski, I just uh, hit ask to unmute. So you should be able to say yes and ask your question. I'm gonna let you work on that for a second and ask a pre-submitted question that I think is highly relevant to your speech, Mr. Kateri. So this one uh, is, are all nations equally fertile ground for fostering democracy or do cultural factors sometimes prevent that system of government from gaining traction? What do you think? Uh, no, absolutely not. Uh, when Bill Clinton said that they wanted to install democracy in Somalia, uh, it was a futile project. Uh, but that doesn't mean that because it cannot happen today, it can never happen. The question is, are we going to do what it takes to uh, uh, move those uh, nations toward a, uh, toward a state that eventually democracy could arise? And the question is, uh, are we going to make uh, good the uh, perfect the enemy of good? Are we going to have, uh, uh, are we going to accept a flawed, some sort of accountable, responsible government that is going to eventually become a mature democracy. And I think Iraq is a very good point in that. We look back at it as a failure, but if you look at it, it was a short-term failure. Uh, Iraqi democracy is exiting adolescence and entering maturity. If you followed what happened in their elections, the protests that have been happening, uh, the Iraqi democracy that started very, 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 uh, uh, let's say, uh, had its uh, beginning uh, on a terrible uh, trajectory, is not working, finally beginning to work. And it takes time for nations that uh, have not practiced it to become accustomed to it, but they eventually become through try and, trial and error if there's just something to work uh, to start with. All right, um, Christina, the tech seems to be not working for you. So we would love to uh, have you ask your question, but we'll have to come back. Um, for now, let's go ahead to Michael Schneider. Go ahead and ask your question to me. Can you hear me? Yes, sir. Oh, okay. I can't see my face, so I don't know. Um, mm -hmm. I, I too, along with my wife, was in the Peace Corps uh, during the Vietnam War and was watching, reading in Newsweek every week about losing multi-million dollar planes and about Agent Orange, which in fact, was a crime, not only against our troops, against the Vietnamese, and against the planet. And I just feel like, you know, the alternative to nation building is more imagination. I was sitting there thinking, well, you know, instead your question? Of, yeah, instead of so your question Vietnam, is instead of bombing people, we could have built water systems and rural electrification and uh, subsidized a bunch of free McDonald's, you know. So your question is, what does the speaker much? think of that? Yeah. <laughs> uh -huh. All right. Thank you. Corrupt uh, what we wanted. We could... Okay. All right. So, Mr. Kateri, um, what do you think about that? The sort of question of development as an alternative to military regime change and state I, I don't think that it's an alternative. I think it's a complement mm -hmm. to uh, our military force. And again, as the previous question suggests, the different uh, situations demand different answers. And uh, in Iran or today or North Korea or Afghanistan or Iraq uh, before we invaded, 
we had regimes that derives their legitimacy from ideologies uh, hostile to the United States. The first question is uh, that we should ask ourselves, uh, would these countries allow any development done by us? And the answer is no, we, we tried and they would, they would happily take our money uh, to do it themselves, they would say, but they would never do that. I mean, we still have this problem with uh, Internet World Bank and IMF that they support a lot of autocrats and uh, by giving them aids and loans and most of these go into, some of them go to development, but most of the money goes into their own prop pockets and security forces they use to uh, oppress their own peoples. And we try to, the, the only way to do such thing is if we have presence there to do it ourselves, which they would never allow. I wish they would. All right. And with that, Mr. Katerius Knight, jazz hands for our Iranian friend, Iranian American. Very good. Only um, American. <laughs> only American. My apologies. Yes. <laughs> okay. Um, well, jazz hands for that too. Yep. Uh, all right. So for our next speaker in the affirmative, we will go to Mr. John Gay. Go ahead and unmute. You have four minutes. Thank you, Madam Chair. And I, uh, would like to zoom out now to the level of grand strategy. You know, what our foreign policy adds up to the big picture. Uh, and I'll argue that nation building is typically a bad idea in that big picture context. So I see two big trend lines in US foreign policy these days. One being great power competition, you know, that the unipolar moment of un largely unchallenged US power of the 1990s and 2000s is over. Russia and China, particularly China, are much more capable of challenging us uh, in a lot of areas, especially in their own neighborhoods. Second big trend line, overextension. Uh, the United States spent the unipolar moment fighting in, uh, in wars, uh, wars of choice, in my view, uh, and expanding its security commitments. Uh, we had significant failures abroad, and at the same time, we had a lot of problems emerge or get worse at home, like the 2008 financial crisis, like the COVID pandemic, all that adds up to structural and political pressures for a more modest security policy. And those stru structural pressures don't seem to be going away. The implication of that is that we have to be very wary of big projects abroad, in particular, ones that don't uh, directly tie up to US interests and the welfare of our people, uh, or that are peripheral to this condition of great power competition, uh, because resources and efforts that we spend in one place are unavailable in another. Uh, so how does nation building fit into that? I mean, for one, it tends to be a big project, so at a minimum, we should be skeptical. Uh, we should have, have a, a higher bar for it than we did previously. Uh, but I'd like to argue that it really doesn't tie up to our interests very well, uh, particularly in the context of a great power competition. So let's assume uh, that the folks arguing in the negative are, are basically correct and that nation building can sometimes be done. Uh, as, uh, as the great security scholar John Mearsheimer pointed out, the main threat to great powers like the United States is actually from other great powers, nations that have already been built, that are very well built. Uh, states that can combine a large population with a large economy are able to generate tremendous amounts of military power, and thus they have to be at the focus of our foreign policy and our defense policy. Uh, the way those states can become more threatening to the United States is by expanding their militaries or by successfully integrating new prosperous and populous areas and thus increasing their ability to generate uh, military power. The thing is nation building is usually done in areas that are economically weak, that are underpopulated or that due to bad governance, lack their ability, lack the ability to mobilize their resources well. In other words, places that in a great power competition are typically of low strategic value. Um, so just for an example, imagine that we had won in Vietnam or the Soviets had won in Afghanistan. I'm not sure that that would have really transformed the US or Soviet positions. What they would own would be fairly weak countries that would still require a lot of resource investment and their victory would have taken a very long time even to get to that point. Um, but assuming that the side I'm arguing for is right and that nation building, uh, that one of its problems is that it usually doesn't work, uh, it makes it an even worse idea to do in a great power competition. And that was the effect of Vietnam and Afghanistan. Uh, it weakened and distracted the nation builders 
It sowed political dissension uh, within those countries. It created opportunities for their rivals to bleed them by supporting the opponents of the nation, uh, the government being built. And the net effect was that it weakened them in their competition with the rivals. And so because it usually doesn't work and often doesn't win you much if it does, the default US policy should be against nation building and against similar efforts to transform other states. And we should also usually not be too worried when our competitors like China and Russia try to do that themselves. Thanks. All right, very good. Jazz hands for Mr. Gay, yes. And for our first question, we'll go to Mr. Kateri. Go ahead and unmute and ask your question to me. Uh, thank you so much. I'm uh, fond of what uh, John Quincy Adams Society does, uh, which complements the society on part of the Alexander Hamilton Society. And, uh, and my question is, uh, I understand the strong objection that you provided to nation building or state building. But after 9-11, on 9-12, one, what do you do with Afghanistan? And two, if you go in, what do you go, what do you do instead of state building once you uh, uh, get, uh, get the Taliban out? All right, very good. Mr. Gay? Yeah, well, uh, Ma Madam Chair, I think I uh, my guidance to US policymakers in that period would have been to stay focused on Al Qaeda. Uh, you know, the Taliban and Al Qaeda had a connection, which is why we went after the Taliban, too. But by the time uh, by the time, for instance, the Battle of Tora Bora happened uh, and parts of Al Qaeda slipped the net, they were out of Afghanistan and the Afghanistan was not the center of the Al Qaeda threat uh, and in particular was not the center and has remained largely not the center of the global Al Qaeda threat and the global uh Islamist terror threat. So I, I think that's one part of the question. The other part is, you know, we excluded the Taliban from the peace process for pretty much the entirety of the Afghan conflict. And in great part, that was because the Taliban didn't want to negotiate with the government that we were supporting. Uh, I think at some point we would have needed to take seriously uh, an effort to bring at least parts of the Taliban into the Afghan state. Uh, you know, that uh, that really is what we got in the end was the takeover of the Afghan state by the Taliban. And so I think some sort of partial reintegration uh, would have been preferable. And I, I'm not sure that it would have been uh, as categorically different on a moral level from what was already happening in rural areas of Afghanistan. A lot of uh, scholars like Vonda Felbat brown uh, have, have uh, shown that the amount of social change in some of these areas was not that dramatic. Uh, and we had to work with a lot of unpleasant partners on our own side, like uh, General Dustum. So that's, that's what I would say to that. All right, and uh, next we'll go to Seth Wager Thompson. Mr. Thompson, Mr. Wager Thompson, excuse me. I have un I've allowed you to talk. Go ahead and unmute and ask your question to me. Thank you, Madam Chair. Can you hear me okay? Yes, sir. Um, Madam Chair, at your discretion, would you please ask one panelist in the affirmative and one panelist in the negative this question. What do you think about this idea? The USA only goes to war to protect our citizens from deadly peril or direct threat to our basic liberty. When the US does go to war, we have a known policy of completely taking over the country and put in place a temporary government that implements as many USA style civil liberties as possible over a period of at least two generations, perhaps 100 years, after which time open USA style elections are held and the US then begins direct diplomatic relations with that elected government. Thank you. Interesting, all right. Um, so uh, given our format, um, Mr. Gay, you get to answer this this time and uh, Mr. King, feel free to address if you'd like in your speech, um, but not until then. Uh, go ahead, Mr. Gay. Sure. Well, I, I basically agree with the first part, you know, that the purpose of U.S. security policy is, is U.S. security. Uh, you know, I think that there are certain international conditions that have to prevail, that we have the ability to influence uh, that are part of that, that, uh, that are not directly implicated uh, in the physical, the immediate physical security of the United States. However, that said, I think the kind of multi-generational effort being described, uh, one would not work in a lot of places because even two generations, uh, as, uh, as I believe Giselle pointed out at the very beginning, 
uh, was not enough when we were trying to nation build our own country. Uh, you know, so I, I think that we would actually not be achieving that. In some, in some ways, we would not be respecting uh, the different political traditions that may emerge in other countries, uh, some of which uh, are not all bad. Um, and I think there are plenty of cases in which we might want to take revenge for an attack on us where we say, hey, we don't actually need to do two generations of nation building or do total takeover. And that also that certainly wouldn't work against nuclear armed great powers. All right. And if that, with that, Mr. Gay is thanked. Jazz hands once again. Yes. Great. Okay. So, um, our, for our final initial speech, and then there'll be response speeches, uh, we will go to Mr. King. Go ahead and unmute, you have four minutes. Thank you, Madam Chair. And thank you to Braver Angels for the invitation to participate in tonight's debate. So as we have seen, the term nation building calls to mind a tangled mess of concepts, including state building, democracy promotion, and regime change. To argue on behalf of nation building then is akin to making a brief for chicken pox or barnacles or worse, nickelback. <laughs> and I'm the fourth speaker to do it tonight. So I ask that you bear with me because I wanna take us in a slightly different direction. My fellow esteemed panelists have already defined the difference between state and nation. My case is for true nation building. That is supporting the growth of national consciousness where it is consistent with US interests. I do not follow Woodrow Wilson here in favor of national self-determination at every time and in every place. My perspective is closer to that of Isaiah Berlin, who said that nationalism was responsible for both magnificent achievements and appalling crimes. Berlin argued at the peak of the post-Cold War moment, no less, that nationalism was the strongest force in the world and he was right. Nationalism cannot be ignored. For the foreign policy practitioner to discount the strongest force in the world, to omit it from strategic consideration, would be a dereliction of duty. And so we ought to consider two cases where it is in the U.S. interest to support the growth of national consciousness. In other words, to nation build. First, to raise costs for our adversaries by supporting nationalist movements within their borders or in countries under their influence. And second, to shore up allies and partners that are struggling with national cohesion. The strategic rationale for both these efforts was expressed long ago and in a different context by Patrick Henry, to raise up friends to fight our battles for us. The canonical example of the first type of nation building, raising costs for adversaries, is British support for the Arab revolt under the inspired leadership of T.E. Lawrence. It cost Britain relatively little to bolster Arab nationalism, and it cost the Ottoman Empire dearly. During World War I, Arab armies expelled the Ottomans from Mecca, Aqaba, and eventually Damascus. But there are other stories, success stories in nation building from US history. During the Cold War, Radio Free Europe and Captive Nations Week encouraged nationalists and dissident movements behind the Iron Curtain and the U.S. policy of non-recognition of um, Soviet occupation over the Baltic states similarly eroded Soviet legitimacy. And finally, after the Gulf War, the no-fly zone over Iraqi Kurdistan allowed Kurdish nationalist forces to create a reasonably well-governed pro-American region. And as for the second type of nation building, supporting healthy expressions of nationalism among our friends, the historic case is the rebuilding of West, the West German army under Konrad Adenauer, which wouldn't have been possible without putting German nationalism under a new and healthier footing. A more recent expression of the strategy is the suite of training, advising, and equipping missions carried out by the US Africa Command. Take the case of Niger, America's favorite counterterrorism partner on the continent. Ever since the Tuareg rebellion ending in 2009, Niger has made a concerted effort to promote an inclusive national identity and integrate ethnic Tuaregs into the armed forces and civil service. For a relative pittance, $4 million a year, the US and other foreign donors support the Nigerian High Authority for Peacebuilding, which provides jobs for former combatants. 
This too is nation building and not at an exorbitant cost. States can ill afford to neglect any instrument of national power. Nation building is an arrow we should keep in our quiver. Thank you. All right, very good. Jazz hands for Mr. King. Yes, excellent. Um, so we're running, this has been so interesting that we're running. Uh, yeah, thank you, Mr. Hanlon for coming on screen to give your jazz hands. I appreciate that. Um, uh, we're running a little bit behind. So I'm gonna um, go with just one question here and it's gonna go to the very patient, uh, Mr. Paul Turkelson. Paul, I have enabled you to talk. Um, go ahead and unmute and ask your question to me. Uh, thank you, Madam Speaker. As a, uh, as a Cold War um, veteran myself and, and beneficiary of the, uh, the all-volunteer force, I'd like to ask the uh, speaker, how would our perspective on nation building change nationally if those who serve were spread out more equitably across the socioeconomic spectrum? In other words, adding a national service requirement so all citizens have some skin or, or blood, so to speak, in the game. All right, go ahead. All right, thank you, Mr. Turkelson, for the excellent question. I think um, you know what you're you're suggesting actually would be an example of a nation building at home, of creating a kind of national ethic of service spread out across all different um, groups in American society. And that might do two things. I think it would certainly be good for the civic health of this country, but it also might provide us with some sense of just how, um, how difficult and how rewarding it is to learn how to live together, which in some sense is the, uh, the mission of this organization. So thank you for the question. Absolutely. And with that, uh, Mr. King is thanks. Jazz hands. One more time. Yes, very good. All right, everybody, this has been fascinating. And we are now uh, moving into the final section of the debate, which is response speeches. Now, panelists, I know I told you you get three minutes and you do, but I'm gonna be a little bit more strict about time than I have been thus far, because we are, as I said, a little bit behind. Um, and if you choose to use less than three minutes, I will not scold you. Um, you're, you will know that you have one minute left when I pick up my gavel and start playing with it. So, uh, and oh, uh, as um, I believe was in the pre-reads, we do our response speeches in reverse order, still going affirmative, negative, affirmative, negative. But um, Mr. John Gay, you are up first. You have three minutes to respond to what's been said. All right. Well, one thing, uh, you know, we've had a, a few folks talk about, uh, you know, the importance of expertise in this and that, you know, it's not either or. And, you know, we kind of need to have smart people uh, determining the cases in which this can work. And while I broadly agree with that, one thing I would point out is that very few people in Washington, myself included, uh, successfully predicted political developments in our own country, uh, especially in 2016. I've asked this question in a lot of rooms. Did you think Trump was going to win? And uh, a lot of people got that wrong, again, myself included. And I think that should inspire some real humility in us about our ability to shape the political outcomes of countries that are foreign to us uh, and to even understand what the driving forces of foreign politics are and in particular what forces predominate at a particular moment. I think, uh, And I think humility would tend to militate against nation building. The second thing, a lot of folks have mentioned the, uh, the pottery barn rule and, uh, you know, as a moral principle, and I'd like to complicate that a little bit. Uh, nation building itself tends to require some fairly severe moral compromises. Uh, in the case, you know, the two most successful cases, Germany and Japan, uh, it arguably required limiting accountability uh, for those states for what they had done in World War II, in particular for some of their war crimes. It was largely accountability at the very top. In the case of Japan, culturally, they didn't really fully reckon with, uh, with what they had done. Um, and state building tends to involve a lot, of, uh, a lot of ugly activity. You know, ask the Vendee in France, ask the native populations of the United States, Canada, Australia. Uh, in the case of things that the United States has done directly more recently, uh, you know, nation building and support for regimes abroad involved support for dictators in places like Korea, and Taiwan, it involved uh, a lot of direct political interference in a whole number of, of, uh, of countries. Uh, I would also add, if nation building generally doesn't work, 
if we're confident it doesn't work in a particular case, it just isn't obligatory. Uh, even if it does work, I think uh, as a matter of restorative justice, it's not always uh, rebuilding a nation uh, to have, for instance, a just government may be going above and beyond uh, restoring the damage that we did in the course of warring with a country. And by the way, a just war is waged in response to a damage that that country has done to us. Uh, and usually the victims uh, are not expected to make significant restitution to those who have harmed them. Um, I, I don't want to say that we should seconds. not apply the Prodigy Barn rule, but I think at a minimum, we need to take a lot of these uh, compromises into account. All right, very good. And with that, Mr. Gay is thanked. Jazz hands for our first response speech. Excellent. All right, and for our second response speech, we will go to um, Mr. King. Go ahead, you have three minutes. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I'll try to keep this brief. I want to start out by agreeing with uh, my esteemed colleague, Mr. Gay, regarding the um, nature of the security environment that we face. We no longer face a benign security environment. We have great power competitors. And this represents a shift from the immediate post-Cold War era. And I think it also requires us to be economical and to get creative in our foreign policy. And that's why I think that we ought to consider the utility of nation building, as I've laid it out here, of supporting national movements, whether um, they are within multi-ethnic empires that are opposed to US interests, such as China or Iran, um, or supporting the growth in national consciousness of countries that find themselves under the influence of adversarial states, um, such as Vietnam or Australia. Um, and so I think that if we can um, understand the power of national sentiment in um, as sort of one of the fundamental building blocks of international politics, that if we can harness that force in our foreign policy, that will serve us well. So um, I think that we have to get creative or, and understand that our resources are limited and not cast any of our tools aside. And as T.E. Lawrence would remind us, nothing is written. So I would encourage us not to be discouraged by um, failures in the, in the past decades, but to look to how we can be nimble and effective in the future. Thank you. All right, very good. And with that, Mr. King is thanked. Jazz hands. Yes, excellent. Um, for our next speech, uh, response speech, we will go to Mr. Chatanier. Go ahead and unmute, you have three minutes. Uh, yes, so, so thank you. Um, so one of my things about I like about this panel is uh, I think there's, there's actually, even in the disagreement, there's a lot of agreement here um, and a lot of points that are in common uh, among, among the panelists. Um, I think, uh, you know, I kind of wanted to address the, to some extent, the question that, that sort of got the most votes there in, in, in the, the middle part of the, the debate there, uh, which is about alternatives to, to nation building. And um, to me, I think the sort of the most important kind of element of that is, is being uh, considerate and conservative in how we use force, uh, thinking about when it's appropriate for the U.S. to be involved in, in, in the use of militarized force. Uh, and Sometimes when we when we get involved in in these conflicts, there's not much of an alternative once it's over, right? To uh, then then to 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 remain involved and, and ensure that things don't blow up again. Uh, but I think more consideration in determining uh, when it's appropriate to to use force, when it's not, uh, when it's appropriate to to get involved uh, is going to be kind of job number one, right? And then once that's done, once we find a situation in which um, the the state of affairs calls for the United States to use force. Then it's a matter of figuring out just how much of a commitment is required, right? And um, and in most of those cases, I think that commitment can be uh, can be best served by some division of labor among uh, the United States, among its allies, and also among the people in the country that that we're dealing with. I think the the idea of sort of the need for for kind of the the building of of, of sort of national identity is is certainly a, a an important point. Um, because these norms are really important. And I think, you know, early in the debate, um, someone brought up the idea of the, 
um, the cases in which sort of nation building has been most successful um, it, are those in which the, uh, I think it was Lieutenant Colonel Davis, uh, the, the situations in which uh, the people on the ground sort of did the work, right? And they were the ones who kind of wanted this to happen. Uh, and those are, those are the situations in which I think it makes the most sense to, to get involved there. Um, so those are, those are my comments. Uh, thank you again. With that, Mr. Satanya is sent. Jazz hands. Yep. Excellent. All right. Uh, and Mr. Gay, I see that you are applauding this way. That is also acceptable. Just so you know. Um, for our next speech, uh, response speech, we will go to Mr. Katiri. Go ahead and unmute. You have three minutes. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, so I, I want to address a question regarding great power competition, or as I like to say great power hostility. Uh, it's not a good faith competition. Uh, I, in 2001, if you go and read Weekly Standards editorial, Bob Kagan and uh, Bill Crystal keep talking about China, 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 until 9-11 happens. And they called for their friend, Paul Wolfowitz, to resign because the, the administration was being soft on China. And suddenly 9-11 happens and everybody gets distracted from China. And to be fair, uh, very few people were warning about China uh, at the time, but everybody gets distracted. And the thing is that after 9-11, uh, we were due to get distracted. Just the political climate that happened at the time. Uh, nobody, the, uh, American politics, it's a democracy. It's a bottom up uh, dictation of policy and American people didn't want to do anything with China after 9-11. They wanted to do with Islamic terrorism because they were scared, right or wrong, they were scared. And, uh, and that's to say that uh, we have an interest to make sure even uh, non-existential threats uh, cannot arrive at home because those non-existential threats could still uh, sway public opinion and uh, result in our distractions. And uh, so when we say about uh, when we say that uh, we should focus more on great power uh, hostility, it is worth remembering that great power we could be again distracted from great power hostility if uh, another attack like that happens. And the the truth is that we are livelier today than we're six months ago that such an attack would happen. Uh, as Taliban has uh, to, taken over Afghanistan. And, uh, one last thing, people talk about that we cannot export democracy because we have a dysfunctional democracy at home. And I'm the first person to talk about, I have written about uh, the ills of our democracy today, but I grew up in Iran. I'll take our dysfunctional democracy here any day over any autocracy. All right, and with that, Mr. Kiri, uh, Katiri, the American is next. Yes, hands. Yes, absolutely. All right. Um, and for our next speech, we will go to Lieutenant, uh, Lieutenant Colonel Davis. You have three minutes. Go ahead. Okay. Sorry about that. Am I back on? You are. Okay. Sorry about that for a second. Uh, just a couple of things I'd like to, to end with. Uh, uh, one, I, I'd like to say a word about uh, Michael O'Hanlon and, and his uh, mention of his Peace Corps and other operations in, in Africa and the, the UN. I, I'm a strong supporter of that and always admire people who do that and, uh, and definitely hats off to you. I think we should do more of that and, and less of the military instrument to, to help other people. And so I'm, I'm uh, certainly for that. Um, with uh, John Gay, I, I couldn't possibly improve on anything he said, so I, I won't even <laughs> attempt to go on to that. Uh, the one thing that I will leave people with here, though, is that uh, <clears throat> we have done a really bad job at, at doing nation building. And we'll just take Afghanistan since that's the most recent one. Uh, I mean, we, we uh, allowed, as some of the people have said, we knowingly allowed a lot of uh, horrible people to have senior government positions. We, some of the government officials that uh, we knew were at the highest positions were very corrupt and we literally did nothing about it. And so we, we basically baked in corruption. When their elections went bad, instead of holding anyone accountable, we said, well, they're an independent nation. And so we allowed the corruption to go on. And then we tried to impose extra constitutional things so that, uh, you know, that they could get away with it even further. And it just continued on. And those corruption things were uh, vital importance to why the 
uh, military fell apart at the very end and why their government couldn't stay afloat. We did nothing about it when we had the chance. Uh, and, and that is because it's just systemically so hard to do to make somebody want to do something that they don't think that they need to do. And just as evidence of why, in, like in so many other examples I gave, it's, it's not. So it's not going to succeed. So that's why I say that we should not do nation building as a general rule, though I do put in the caveat that there could be ex exceptional circumstances sometimes that we may need to for our own benefit. But we should not do these for the benefit of some other country, only for the benefit of our, of our own country, uh, because we're just not good at it. All right. And with that, uh, Ms. Lieutenant Colonel Davis is thanked. Jazz hands. Yes. Very good. All right. Uh, so we are on the home stretch now. Um, Mr. O'Hanlon, you have three minutes. Go for it. Thank you. I'm really just going to come back to where we began with Charlotte. And I think we all owe a debt of gratitude to people like Charlotte and Colonel Davis and those who have sacrificed so much. And even though we are having a big high level theoretical debate about state building, I also wanna say, and this builds on what Giselle said before, I wanna thank those who served in Afghanistan and elsewhere in American uniforms, because not only did they give Afghanistan and Iraq a chance, and you know maybe not all of that's gonna be lost, as Giselle said, let's take the long view of history and let's see what happens in 10 and 20 and 30 years. But they also protected us and we have not been attacked in the United States by a major extremist group with substantial casualties of the type that were feared in the last 20 years. We've had roughly 100 American fatalities since 9-11 on US soil from Salafist or jihadi terrorism, 100. If you had asked policymakers on September 12, 2001, what would be your expectation for the next two decades? And you had said 100 fatalities total over that period on American soil, that would have alleviated their worst case worries far beyond their realistic expectations. So our troops have done a lot and yes, it's sometimes been conflated with state building and nation building in a way that uh, has not succeeded on the terms that were preferred. But nonetheless, we have been safe here in the United States and that's a big accomplishment. And then finally, I would say, as Amy McGrath and I wrote recently, that we have created deterrence against Al Qaeda and the Taliban. I don't think they really wanna mess with us. I don't, even though they might've won the tactical fight within Afghanistan, I don't think they want to collaborate with extremist movements to attack us again. Now, maybe the state building part of the enterprise failed in some sense, but the overall commitment to work hard with partners around the world to defend our own territory and our own security, we have shown our mettle we have shown our commitment and deterrence has been increased in my judgment. So that's a little bit of a tangent, April, with apologies to the core central proposition of the debate tonight. But I do think it's important since we're talking about people in uniform and other Americans who have served, who are still listening tonight to this conversation, who have given so much. I wanna say on multiple levels, you have done a lot for this country and even if it was in sometimes the service of a state building agenda that may not have been fully realized, there have been a lot of accomplishments. Thank you. All right. And with that, Mr. Hanlon is thanked. Jazz hands. I think we all agree with that last part. Yep. All right. Uh, Charlotte, for the final affirmative speech of the night, go ahead. Thank you so much. I I wanna offer my uh, thanks and gratitude to the other panelists for their enlightening speeches. Even when I disagreed, I found some clarity in our positions. And so I greatly appreciate the discussion that's right in good faith. You know, I think about something Napoleon once said, uh, he, well, he supposedly said it, his, his private secretary wrote his memoirs and uh, wrote that Napoleon once said that it is better to merit a scepter than to possess one. That basically, it is better to merit the 
merit the characteristics it would take to be a, a great statesperson uh, than to actually be one. Um, and there's a few levels there that I think apply so well to our disastrous forays into Iraq and Afghanistan. And that's primarily that, you know, one, we as Americans tend to want to, our government, I should say, tends to want to buy favor instead of lead by example. Uh, and it has really, um, really demolished, I think, our reputation around the world in ways that might be irreparable at this point. Uh, and, and a rather scary prospect of facing generations of repairing all the damage that's been done over the past 20 years. The second layer here, though, is I think the strange way that we center our arrogance and believe in that our system is what should be around the world in the first place. Uh, we are not even in the top 20 countries in terms of uh, things like homelessness, hunger, um, uh, economic uh, uh, disparity per capita. I mean, all of these metrics that define a great nation, we're really lacking in them. And I love my country, but I love my country not because of the things that we are, but the, but the way we could be. We have all the pieces here, and yet for some reason, our ambition tends to cloud our judgment a lot. And if we keep doing this and, and failing to learn the lessons of the past 20 years, there are gonna be a lot more people like my friend Joseph Hernandez who pay the price for that not the lawmakers, not their staffers, not uh, wonderful good faith folks at, at think tanks in DC. It's going to be primarily military families and civilians caught in the crossfire. And if we do not center that lesson of the past 20 years, we are doomed to repeat it. Again, not, you know, Vietnam was not a one-off, Afghanistan's not a one-off. This will happen again unless we take measures to prevent it. And I, I pray to God every day that doesn't happen. Thank you all. All right, and with that, Ms. Clemmer is thanked. Jazz hands. Mm -hmm. And for our final response speech of the night, Giselle Donnelly, go ahead and unmute, you have three minutes. Uh, I apologize, Madam Chairman, I had a wiggy internet connection. Um, no problem, we can hear you now. Yeah, okay. Uh, listen, um, I'm a student of history, I'm not a political scientist. Um, I've spent my professional life um, try working around people in uniform and trying to advance their interests. They're among the people I love the most. Um, but, I've, you know, war is a brutal, brutal thing. And the use of military force is a, the use of a very blunt instrument. This is always the case. Um, and there's really no way around it. The only way to use it responsibly is, is through prudent, but not paralyzed statecraft that requires a balancing act between things that are disgusting and ugly and brutal and terrible and things that are glorious and wonderful and honorable and liberating. If you consider what America has done not just in the last 20 years, but over the course of our history, and even over the course of our colonial experience, the trend lines and the achievements are really quite remarkable. So we cannot allow the mistakes that we've made, the lives that were lost, or the dollars spent that might have been spent otherwise to paralyzes us in our quest, in our mission. Charlie quite rightly said that we have hopes for the future. We are here to try to progress, to perfect our union, and to make the benefits of our style of government, our view of justice, as widely and broadly available to as many people as possible. For us to use power, we must have a purpose. And that needs to be guided by our political principles and our moral beliefs, especially when we have failed and when we have fallen down. We should pick ourselves up and continue on and keep this important tool of our statecraft and our strategy 
in the quiver. Thank you. This has been a great debate. I've been delighted to participate. And thank you for your supervisory, uh, your futile efforts, uh, Madam Chairwoman. My pleasure. With that, Ms. Donnelly is thanked. Jazz hands, yes, absolutely. All right, folks. Um, so we have one final piece here, uh, just uh, and then a little bit of housekeeping, and then we'll let you go, um, which is just, a. this is now a little bit less formal, and we're just going to um, ask everyone uh, to answer two debrief questions. And they are, and uh, we're gonna open the chat so that attendees, you can put your answers to these questions in the chat as well. Um, and in a minute, we'll also do a poll. The, the two questions are, what did you learn tonight? And what did you enjoy? And I'm gonna start just because I'm in charge, so I get to do that and say that I learned more from this debate than I have from almost any that I can remember participating in. It was really excellent. And I, uh, gosh, I just felt myself being persuaded this way and then that way, and then this way and then that way. And um, uh, so I learned a great deal, um, particularly about not just how to engage this sort of analytically and, and factually, but also morally. And so, I, uh, I really appreciated that. Um, and I enjoyed uh, seeing a Lieutenant Colonel offer jazz hands. And I also enjoyed, um, uh, I enjoyed um, each speaker had their own voice in, in tonight's debate. And that was really, really neat. Um, so uh, um, panelists, you can just raise your, your physical hand or your Zoom hand, I don't care. Um, and uh, tell us, I'll, I'll call on you. Yeah, Giselle, what did you learn and what did you enjoy? I did, what I was reminded of is how closely run these questions are. So I argued a position that I believe in about 50.1% uh, <laughs> any sense uh, whatsoever. Mm -hmm. And the, uh, certainly um, I'm reminded uh, of the costs uh, not just in nation building exercises, but in all uses of military force. Uh, and the thing that I enjoyed the most was just the, the civility and the camaraderie amongst the, the panel. Uh, people argued their case uh, with great verve and, and vigor, uh, but always with civility and respect. Can't, mm -hmm. Wonderful. can't have too much of that. <laughs> That's for sure, especially these days. Um, other folks, by the way, the, the comments in the, in the chat are wonderful. The first one was, I learned more here than watching all the news broadcasts and, um, you know, thank you for the candid insight, excellent debate on both sides. People, yeah, really good things in there. So, so take a look. Um, others, anyone else want to share? Uh, Mr. King, go ahead. I'll share, uh, that I learned from Mr. O'Hanlon a lot about UN peacekeeping operations that I didn't know before. So I greatly appreciated that. And then in terms of what I enjoyed, I think I was just really uh, impressed and touched by the candor of veterans and service members uh, among the panelists and uh, among the audience who asked questions. And I thought that that was a distinguishing feature of tonight's debate. So um, thank you for your contributions. Wonderful. Mr. Chatonnier. Yes, uh, so, so I, um, you know, I, I'm, I'm an academic, so I kind of work in, in the abstract. Um, so, so I learned a lot from kind of talking to a lot of people who, are, who have been either been on the ground um, involved in this or people involved in the policy world. And, and hearing their perspectives was, was great. And it's, it's enlightening for me, um, just kind of as a citizen and, and also for somebody who can, you know, kind of call on this in, in their work. So I, I really appreciated that. And I, I enjoy the fact that, again, um, despite the fact that we're on kind of different sides on the debate, uh, it seems like there is a lot in common. And, uh, and I think um, the, there was a lot of thoughtfulness here and, uh, and, and I just really enjoyed being a part of it. I agree, a lot of thoughtfulness, yeah. Mr. Kateri, go ahead. Uh, what I learned is what I enjoyed is what I remember is that uh, despite our many disagreements and many agreements, there, there was a lot of overlap, but I'm reminded of the nation that we are mm -hmm. and that is not represented by the loud voices that we hear. And 
I love that. I, I, it is very easy to uh, screen past uh, my friends on the other side uh, uh, about our disagreements, but, uh, but that's, that's not how most people interact. And unfortunately, social media make, make this much worse. And it is yet another reminder of uh, face-to-face, the value of face-to-face disagreements that uh, mm-hmm that restrain the worst instincts that we have. Mm -hmm. Absolutely, thank you for that. Yes, Uh, Ms. Clymer. I uh, greatly enjoyed the clarity and nuance of all the panelists and particularly those who were in opposition to my own opinion. Uh, I felt that they engaged in such good faith and it led to a really interesting conversation in which we actually learned things from each other instead of just you know trying to win the argument. Uh, and I learned uh, that foreign policy might be perhaps the single most prominent issue that folks across the political spectrum can find a lot of agreement in. And I truly hope we take advantage of that uh, and, and use it as a point of uh, consensus uh, moving forward. Excellent. Wonderful. Yeah. All right. Um, Lots of, again, wonderful comments. I learned to feel more hopeful about the future. Um, I want the whole country to hear this, that kind of thing. So um, panelists, last call, and then we'll do our poll. All right. Um, Cliff, if you would launch our, our final poll of the evening, that would be great. Everybody, you have one minute to answer. Alrighty, excellent. Um, so people like a lot of aspects of this debate in pr- most of all the respect shown to others, um, truthfulness and honesty of, op- of, of opinions shared. And also a lot of folks have a deeper understanding of the issues. They also loved your energy and passion and your personal experience. So this was a win all around. Um, uh, with regard to what I heard tonight affects how I think about this issue, over half of people said that they somewhat agree or strongly agree with that. That's very good. And wow, <laughs> 98%. I think that's the highest number we've ever had for I am more able to see how the other side thinks on this. So really well done, folks. That's really good. Um, yeah, that's like a record. I think our highest before was like 92 or something. So very impressive. Um all right, well, I'd like to ask everybody just to, to give us, uh, let's give one more round of jazz hands um, for all of this. And uh, we have a couple final housekeeping notes and then we will we will close up. So um, I uh, just wanna say that if you liked this um, and are not yet a member of Braver Angels, uh, we would love for you to become one. And I wanna turn the floor over to, to one of our, um, our wonderful volunteers, Luke Phillips, uh, to tell us why you're part of this. Talk to us, Luke. Well, uh, for all due disclosure, Madam Chair, I am uh, not a volunteer. I am uh, staff now, but I oh, do. Yeah. Right we right finally right. hired him. <laughs> yes, yes. So all that being said, um, so thank you, all of our panelists. Thank you for being here on this. Uh, this is just a good reminder of a lot of things to me. Um, but one of the things that it reminds me of most especially is that the uh, one of the the uh, initial kind of causes of American party polarization way back 230 years ago in the 1790s. One of the things that formally drove the parties uh, into the forms that they took was a question of foreign policy, whether the fledgling United States of America should uh, be generally friendly to or generally aloof from the, uh, the French Revolution happening overseas, right? Um, And so in some senses, a lot of the basic questions of American foreign policy change all the time, but they still polarize us in all kinds of ways, uh, uh, decade by decade, year by year. And the thing that I have always just found wonderful about the work that Braver Angels does, and it's why I volunteered for it for years and years, and uh, why I've committed myself to working for it nowadays, is because I really do believe in our mission. I really do believe 
that uh, politics is politics. It has its own logic. It won't go away. Policy is policy and it won't go away. But the attitudes you bring towards it, the way you treat each other as you engage it, in it, the way you uh, interact with your fellow Americans, who you'll never come to anything resembling common ground on, the way you work on that uh, says a lot of things about uh, political culture. And if you come with the right sorts of spirit, uh, it opens up new possibilities that might never have seemed possible at all. And we at Braver Angels work on doing all sorts of uh, programs, some of which include debates like this one, others of which include uh, workshops, uh, red blue workshops, um, uh, depolarizing within workshops, other sorts of programs to, uh, to open up uh, more ways for Americans across all divides, especially the red blue divide, but other cultural and social and political divides can see the humanity and the decency and the dignity in each other in ways that can maybe help us uh, have a little bit uh, better uh, way of engaging great public issues. And again, this is uh, uh, something that at heart, at root, is a grassroots effort. It's at heart and root a, uh, a citizen by citizen thing. But as I hope we demonstrated tonight, this is something that also hits uh, extreme relevance for the highest levels of American statecraft and the highest levels of the future of American uh, politics and destiny. And so uh, I'm just honored to be working with everybody on this uh, to, uh, to be bringing these kinds of events to people. So um, so all that being said, uh, we cannot do it without you. We cannot do it without um, the, uh, the uh, support and love and friendship and membership of uh, Americans all across the country from every background, from every walk of life. And so uh, there should be links in the chat going in right now to join Braver Angels to, uh, and to, uh, to subscribe to our work. Um, if you're interested in coming to more events like this debate, if you're interested in coming to uh, public forums and to workshops, if you're interested in helping set up these events, if you're interested in uh, uh, figuring out how to get involved in Braver Angels on the ground near uh, in, your in your locality, um, there are all kinds of ways to do that. And we look forward to working with you on that in the, in the future. We couldn't do, do it without you. So, um, but with that, Madam Chair, thank you for uh, giving me the opportunity to uh, say some things that, uh, that this org has meant to me. And uh, in the meantime, I look forward to uh, seeing many of you on many future events and uh, working as we move forward into the future to build a house united and help Americans see the good in each other. All right, thanks so much, Luke. Jazz hands for Mr. Phillips, yes. Um, wonderful. Uh, so like Luke said, um, we cannot do this alone. And so we invite you both to join Braver Angels as a member, it's braverangels.org. And, um, and also uh, we would love to invite you to volunteer. If you like this, our, um, this is done almost entirely by volunteers. Uh, it turns out we do pay a few people like Luke, but mostly <laughs> it's, it's volunteering. And so um, I promise you it's also very fun. We're having a Halloween debate tomorrow where everyone will come in costume and it will be chaired by Madam Scare. Anyway, uh, so join us, let us know if you wanna volunteer. You can email um, any of us. Uh, my email is april at braverangels.org. You can email um, the place you got your link, any of the emails that you see. Um, and finally, if uh, two, um, two ways you can follow up if you're interested, one is, uh, sign up for our next debate. Um, we're doing our next one's on climate change. It's on November 11th. And I think it'll be very interesting. And that one's a community debate. So anyone who uh, attends can also give a speech. And so even if you don't want to do that, either way, you should come. And I think it'll be excellent. And um, also, if you are want to do this, somebody mentioned the virtue of face-to-face -face conversation, Shay, I think. Um, and we have uh, local chapters, which we call Alliance. It's almost um, just all over the country. We have a presence in all 50 states. And so that's, a, um, that's also a great way to get involved if you want to, like, actually meet other people and, and build, uh, have these conversations across the divide in person. 